Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. That is so good. Uh, Ephesians, if you will. I have absolutely no idea what part this is. In fact, when I put my notes up there, I, I put a big question mark, so they don't even, they don't even, oh, part 14. Jeez, man, I didn't know we had so much to say. You know, something about getting older. We talk a lot, don't we? <laughs> Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 21. For those of you who just joined us, uh, you can pick this series up at any time. Bottom line, here it is. You want a great marriage, you're going to have to find out what the creator of marriage has to say about having a great marriage. I wouldn't suggest going to the carnal world and trying to find out what some social guy would have to say or some psychologist or some uh, uh, you know, person such as that that would have something to say about how to do marriage. But I would suggest you find out how to do marriage according to the Bible. You can go to a lot of counselors who've got a lot of worldly information and it won't help you a bit until you get on the Word of God and do marriage God's way. And it's not, uh, no, it's not easy. It's not difficult because uh, you have to constantly rely on the Holy Spirit. If you're going to try to do anything outside of the Holy Spirit, you're just going to try to do it in your own power and you're not going to make it. And bottom line, that isn't going to bring you to where you need to be. And as a married couple, you need to not forget that there's a third party in your marriage. And the third party is God himself. And um, a lot of times we see the wife or we see the husband for who they are, what they do, but we don't ever really think about uh, the third party. And if you'll start doing things according to what God says instead of what you feel, uh, it's going to make all the difference in the world. But how in the world can you ever do the things that God would have you to do if you don't know what it is he wants you to do. I mean, stop and think about it for a while. You could sit there and go to church forever. You pray forever. And still, Has anybody ever prayed about stuff and it doesn't change? You know, sometimes when, we, sometimes when we pray about stuff and it doesn't change in our life, could it be that we're out of sync with God? We need to just start doing the right thing. And so for all of us, we need to understand that. Ephesians 5th chapter, starting verse number 21, I'll read it to you. Submitting one to another in the fear of the Lord. I mean, that really sums everything up. Because I love, I respect, and I honor God so much, that's why I do what I do. That's what just right now with Mike and Pam Espinoza, that's exactly what made the difference between us blessing them and then trying to sweep it under the carpet so nobody knows. Baloney to that. I mean, we respect, we love God so much, and we are so fearful of what God, we do what God wants us to do, no matter what we feel or think or people say or do. This is not about what your mom and dad taught you. It's not about what Spock or Dr. So-and-so tells you, or, you know, Dr. Phil says on television, or Oprah Winfrey. It's all about what God says. And if you don't know what God says, you can't do anything. And that's what we're at is finding out the creator of marriage, what he says. Verse number 22 comes, the wives submit yourself to your own husbands under the Lord. Never talked about that. For the husband is the head of the wife. We talked about being the head. We talked about not only being the head, but the wife also letting him be the head and seeing and recognizing him as the head. Be the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. In other words, God's desire is for you to be cleaned up in a mighty way so that we can become the bride of Christ. Yes, I understand that. And that same image he takes and transfers into husband and wife marriages. It's not going to happen until the husband starts doing the things that God has commanded him to do and the wife starts doing the things that the wife's commanded to do. I love it when you go in for Christian counseling and they say to you, well, what should I do in our marriage? And then we give them stupid counseling. 
Like, well, you need to smile more. You need to forgive him or you need to do. I mean, yes, that's probably stuff we need to do. But man, here it comes along. If you do your four things, ladies, and the husband does his eight things, we have rang the bell. It's going to happen. God's going to anoint it. God will back his word if you start operating. We come along and say, well, I need to change here and I need to change here. Yeah, you do, but if you, that's what doing the word of God is all about. Verse number, I think it's 26 that we're in. He might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Verse number 28, so husbands ought to love their own wives, even as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. And for no one ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it. I just loved last week's on Cherish. I don't know if you got anything out, but man, I, I got so much out of how to cherish the wife. That was a, like a bizarre, uh, that was, I mean, that was like the Holy Spirit speaking to me as it was coming out through me to you. And it was the most uh, interesting. I, I just love that word cherish. And it, it's placing a value on the wife and how to place that value on her. And it was just really important for all of us, just as the Lord does the church. We are members of his body and his flesh and uh, of his bone. For, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 33. Nevertheless let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects. One translation says reverent. Reverence her husband. Reverence is an interesting word. Uh, it's, it's, it's a Deborah talked about it, but men really love to be respected as men. I mean, don't give me flowers and tell me how much you love me. Respect me as a man. Know that I'm trying. Know that I'm working. Know that I'm not perfect. And I need you to come along and help me, strengthen me, and respect me enough. And that's where the word respect comes in. And the old translation of that word is the word reverend, where we get the word reverend. Reverence, where we get the word reverend from. In other words, see him, wife, as a holy man and respect him as someone that God has given you. Wow. When you do that, man, you, 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 you're going to make putty out of that man. Not looking for flowers, not looking for candy. Look for respect. All through this scripture, you're going to see the wife is to be loved by the husband. Not one time does it say the wife is to love the husband. It says the wife respects the husband. Because men look for something different than our, our idea of love is different than a woman's idea of love. Does anybody listen? <laughs> Respect your husband. Verse, let's go back, if you will, verse number 31. Here's tonight's message. For, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Will you go with me to Genesis in the second chapter? Immediately, one of the very first things that God speaks to Adam. He has put Adam to sleep. He's taken the woman from the rib of Adam. He brings this woman to Adam, the second chapter. And the, Adam is in the naming business. He's naming all the animals, doing all the things he knows how to do. But one of the fascinating things that takes place in verse 23, he makes a statement. And the statement that God makes, now I, at first when I read this, I was wondering, is this God making the statement or is this Adam making the statement? It's really fascinating if you really stop thinking about this because if you go back up to verse 23, it says, And Adam said, This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, so shall be called woman. You know, he's in the naming business because she was taken out of man. And then the next verse, it says, Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Oh, wait a minute, I'm stopping to thinking about this. And I said, is this Adam speaking, verse 24? Or is this God speaking, verse 24? And you have to come to the conclusion that it's God speaking. I mean, you don't have to, you can do anything you want to do. You got to come to the conclusion that it's God speaking. And you look at that and says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. In other words, <clears throat> here's this woman that I took from your side. And because I took her from your side, she's now called woman. First thing it says to Adam, or if it's God speaking, first thing God says to Adam is, 
is that this man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, maybe he didn't get that or not, but Adam and Eve didn't have a father and mother. So, this statement can't come from someone who doesn't have father and mother. I'll call her a woman, verse 23, because she's taken from my side. And because I've called her a woman, a man should leave his father and his mother. He doesn't have father and mother. That has to be an inspiration of God's desire. And it's repeated in scripture for all of us. It's really heavy. And if it's an inspiration of God's desire, then we ought to pay more attention to it than just blowing it off like something is being said from, you know, something of no importance. Because here's the very first thing God says about Adam and Eve together. Because if you take from your side, she's a woman, and you two are one, then you need to leave your father and mother. And he didn't say it for Adam and Eve because they didn't have a father and mother. It's recorded for you and I. <laughs> So it's really an interesting verse when you stop and you think about it. Now I had a real hard time with this because a lot of times we'll see all through scripture, Old Testament scripture, where, where, where the kids hang around the parents. You know, he's the God of Abraham, what is it? Isaac and Jacob. And you'll find that the families live together and work together and farm together and raise their stock together and they move together from place to place. And this was part of the culture of the Old Testament was families literally sticking together. But here comes this statement that says, because it's a woman taken from your side and she's one with you. And here comes a statement that God says, an interesting statement, that you are to leave your father and your mother. Well, wait a minute. How come then in all through the Old Testament, you'll see example after example example of the fathers and the sons and the daughters all working together in the household. I mean, Abraham traveled with his family. It's just fascinating. And I never had a real answer for that, and you don't either, until God spoke to me many years back. And I'll tell you a little story. I was a brand new pastor. I was probably my early 30s. I don't even <laughs> I don't even remember what my early 30s were like. I think I had a lot more hair. But I don't much remember anything else. And, and, and this couple came in for counseling. I didn't know who they were. And uh, they came in and they were having marital problems. They were an older couple. I mean, they were really, really old. They were like in their 60s. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's the way I looked at this. Oh, my God, these people are old. Now I'm older than them. And, and, and as they sat before me, they told me the story about how they fight constantly and they just don't get along. And I'm thinking, here I am. And I could tell right off the bat, you know, they, they were not relating with me because I was like this punk kid that had only been married a couple of years. And, and here's these couple that, that had been married. I think they were married for over like 40 years, 42, 43 years. But they were fighting all the time. They came in for counseling. And as we were talking, I, I'm thinking, what in the world am I going to say to these people that have been married longer than I've been alive? That's kind of a tough spot to be in, guys. And all of a sudden, I heard the voice of God said something to me. He said, tell him that he hasn't left his mother and father yet. And I'm going, what? I had no idea where the verse was. I knew it was in the Bible, but I really, I'm being honest with you, I, I, I couldn't really just say, oh yeah, that's found in, in Genesis second chapter, that's found in Ephesians. And stuff. I had no idea, I just heard the voice of God. Thank God you can hear from God. Thank God God wants to speak to all of us that are dummies. Anybody in here a dummy like me? And, and, and you, you literally don't need to quote scripture. I need to hear from God so I can hear what his voice says. And he says, tell, I, 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 in my heart, I hesitate. I stop for a second and say, I'm, I, I'm sure I didn't hear God right. He says, I told you, tell him that he hasn't left his father and his mother. And I looked at this guy and I said, okay, I've got something I want to say to you. 
I said, here's the problem. You guys are fighting and you can't get along and you're, and you're uptight with each other and you're both at each other's throats all the time. And, and the problem is, sir, you haven't left your father and your mother. And he just stared at me, dead silent. And he says, Pastor, my parents have been dead for 40 years. I've left them. And I went, gulp. I must not have heard from God. I, I wonder who that was I heard from. Have you ever heard, have you ever heard something from God you weren't quite sure it was God? I'm going, oh, oh, oh. And, and then God just started speaking through me. And he says, you haven't left your father and mother because you still want to live your life like them and you want her to do it with you. And all of the bad habits his mother and father had that he remembered. He was carrying that over. This is the way she should cook. This is the way we ought to do things. This is the way we set our finances. This is the way we believe for the future. This is what we do. The parents did it who weren't even Christians. And now he's expecting his wife to do it. And they're constantly in conflict. Because he hadn't left his father and mother. It wasn't just leaving them physically and moving to a different place. That solves the problem of the New Testament. I left them spiritually. He needed to find his way with his wife according to what God has to say not according to what his parents had to say and it set me and them free at that very time and a lot of times what we do is we look at a verse like this and we want to live our lives out according to what we know how to do marriage like and how do we know how to do marriage like we've lived with people who are married we saw dad's anger. We saw mom's uh, frustrations. We saw the way mom cooked, the way she cleaned, the way she washed, the way she did things. And all of a sudden, with our hard-headed ways of doing things, we implement that on our own families. And what we do is we bind them up to be like our parents instead of leaving the... Notice how he says, we ought to leave our mother and father talking to the man. Because he's the head of the house. And what we need to all recognize is that God's called us, when you get married, to a clean slate. Doesn't mean you physically get away from your mother and father. So maybe some of you need to do that. I don't know. But that's how he's talking about. You physically get away from the ways they were and do the spiritual stuff that God would have us to do. And build the family together spiritually. And that's what he's talking about. And that's why you see... Testament after testament in the Old Testament, story after story of families working together, but they build their own heartbeat together. And that's what this is all about. I don't want Luke and Stacy and Dan and Jess and any of my other children to build on us. I want them to build on Jesus. And when you build on Jesus, it doesn't mean you leave me out of the picture. It just means you bring a greater picture in, and his name is Jesus. Someone say amen. So uh, I, I thought what would be kind of neat as the Spirit of the Lord was leading me to do this is to give you some insight on how to leave your mom and dad. <laughs> Don't tell them I said this. But if, uh, if, if you like, as how to leave your father and mother, there are some things to look at. Remember, we're not talking about leaving father and mother physically. I don't want anything to do with you anymore type thing. Not doing that at all. We're talking about leaving their ways and developing new ways with your own spouse. And man, I'll tell you what, it set that guy free those years, set me free, and I'll never forget it. Here's number one. Establish a firm family foundation. Without a firm family foundation, and it cannot be built on your parents, that's not a firm family foundation. Your parents, if they were godly and Christian parents, should have only pointed the way to Jesus Christ. You see, that the way to firm family foundation was in Jesus. And so a lot of times we build family foundations based on stuff of the world. 
In other words, if I'm a Charger fan, my kids wear Charger shirts and we do Charger things together. Now, it just happens that they lost tonight, but <laughs> sorry about that. Or if I'm a fisherman, I'll, I'll build family foundation on fishing. Now, it's not that you don't enjoy the Charger game or go fishing with your kids. I'm not saying that. Those are perfectly fine to do, but make sure that there's a firm family foundation. The firm family foundation can only be built, listen to me, in Jesus. If it's built on a football game or a characteristic of the parent or uh, ideologies or philosophies of people, you know, kids always have a tendency to be and do what their parents are. If they're Democrats, the kids grow up Democrats. If they're Republicans, the kids grow up Republicans. If they grow up this way, the kids' parents were that way, the kids grow up that way. Whether you like it or not, I've heard it a million times where people start to grow. They get in their 40s and 50s, they say, oh my goodness, all of a sudden I start to see my mother in the mirror, or my father in the mirror, I start to be like them. And you may have a great mom and dad, and that's fine, but you know, God's telling you to develop a firm family foundation, and the only way to develop a firm family foundation is to start off right. Now, you might be at a Charger game, but you know, before you went to the game, you guys prayed. You might be fishing. Before you go and fishing, you spent time with God, and you talked. And firm family foundation is not just doing fun things together. It's times of communion. It's times of Bible study. It's times of talking about the Word of God. It's time of designing the attitudes and uh, applications of one's life based on what God says instead of what the world has to do. Without a firm family foundation, families don't make it. And by the way, then you'll try to find a firm family foundation. And here's where you try to find it. And what you know, and what you know is what your parents did instead of what God says. And then you find yourself all screwed up because you're trying to be like them instead of being like God. Is anybody listening? Okay, so let's take a look at a scripture. In Isaiah 28, verse 16. Isaiah, go with me to the Old Testament. Isaiah 28. And then let's take a look at verse number 16. Listen to what it says. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, prophetically about Jesus, no doubt about it. But this is the point. Let's take a look at what a firm family foundation has got to be built on. Now, I'm, I'm a builder. Deborah and I have a development company. We're in construction as we speak. And a lot more construction down the road. Uh, literally being worked on right now with cities and engineers at this moment, well, probably not while we speak, but certainly during the daytime hours of work hours. And um, so Debbie and I know about development. And we know that if the foundation, I remember just building this project we're on right now, and my contractor was there that's pouring the concrete. I said, I don't care what you do, but I want you to double and triple and quadruple, and I want you to check this foundation. Because if it's off, everything else is off in the whole place. And I want you to do it right. I want you to check it once. Oh, Pastor, it's done. It's done. No, check it again. Check it again. Check it again until I made them crazy on this firm family foundation. Because it's the same thing. Everything you're going to build your life on can't be from your parents. It's got to be from God. Are, are, we, are we there? So he prophesies this. It says, Behold, I lay in Zion. A stone for a foundation. Thank God Jesus is the rock. And he comes along and he makes us a, a tried stone. Didn't, wasn't he tried? Wasn't there pressure? A precious cornerstone, sure foundation. And whoever believes will not act hastily. In other words, he comes along and makes a statement. There's one you can build your life on. And that is Jesus. A firm family foundation. Number two. If you're going to leave your parents, not only you're building a firm family foundation on Jesus, may I say this to you, also you've got to have to get a hold of this. You're going to have to create godly memories. One of the things that Deborah and I do all the time is we remember those times when God spoke to us, when God dealt with us, when God opened doors for us, when God closed doors for us, when God did great mighty miracles, and we built in our family 
not what my mom and dad did, their memories, even though they were great, but I had to have memories myself of what God could do for my family and for my life. And so creating godly memories is vitally important for everybody. Because can I just say something? When the devil attacks and the pressures come, it's the memories that you have that hold you in place to keep you going forward. Now let me say it again. When the devil attacks, listen to this, and the pressures come and they will come and there will be attacks. It's the memories you have that keep you in place, keeping you going forward. And if you don't have godly memories, and when you're building a family foundation, listen to this, a firm family foundation, it's in Jesus, but then you're building godly memories. Memories of Bible studies at home. Memories of arguments about why you can't do it, kids, because Jesus is not right. It's, I don't care if it's good to the world. It's not good. Memories of your standing strong. Memories of mom praying in the middle of the night. Memories of dad putting his foot down and saying, this is the way this godly house is going to go. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Memories that kids can always remember. And it's called, it just changes everything. And you create memories. And you have to work at creating memories. In other words, you don't create memories just because you want to create memories. You create memories because you do something. In other words, if I'm going to do something, if I remember something that was impressive to me, it's because I did something. I can't expect something to be impressive to me if I didn't do something. So if I'm going to create godly memories, I've got to do something godly to remember. Sit back, do nothing. So, you know, maybe it's this. Maybe it's you bring your kids, let's just say for an example, to church. Uh, and, and every week, you go get a hamburger with them at the Love Rock Cafe. You know, when they grow up, they'll say, man, those were great times. And oh, the French fries. And you go, well, they were so good. What's so good about it? I don't even remember. That. But they remember it as something. That's a godly created a godly memory. Every week, mom and dad caught us up. Every week, we went to church. Every week, we heard the word. Every week, we prayed together. Every week, we set the world aside and talked as a family. Every week, we had communion. Every week, we went to dinner at this one place. Every week, does, does anybody ever eat tamales at Christmas? Raise your hand to me. Okay, now listen to what I'm going to say to you. You know why you love tamales at Christmas? It was a family memory. And it's the same thing. You, I mean, I, I was so mad at our Spanish-speaking service, I told Dr. Powell, I'm shutting the Spanish-speaking service down. He says, why am I, why are you shutting it down? I said, because all the tamales went over to you this Christmas. I was the first time in history I had no tamales. And it's a memory. Now, I've said that a number of times, and I am flooded with tamales right now. So please don't bring me any of the tamales. But my point being, oh, you'll take them. The kids will take them. There you go. <laughs> but, you know, the point being is we do these memories, and we put God on it. And then all of a sudden, your family has this godly memory. And you'll live on those memories during the tough times that keep you going forward. Let me prove it to you. Look at this. If you go with me to the scripture, go back to the New Testament. Don't go to 1 Timothy, but go to 2 Timothy. When you get to 1 Timothy, there's another book right behind 1 Timothy. It's called... Is anybody there? It's called... I'm giving you the hint. If you get to 1 Timothy... And there's another book right behind 1 Timothy, and it's called... Let's try that again. When you get to 1 Timothy, there's a book right behind 1 Timothy, and there's another book behind 1 Timothy, and it's called... Whoa, you're getting so smart on me. Again, godly memories. <laughs> we just created one, I hope. Chapter number one, verse number one says, Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise, I love this, of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Somebody wants to know about, I just go forever. I preach a month on that subject right there. To Timothy, my beloved son, Timothy being 
if not his real son, but his spiritual son. Grace and mercy and peace and God and Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my fathers did, as without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears. There it is, creating godly memories. I'm mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. In other words, man, he gets elated when he starts to think about Timothy, is what he just said, because he just had something very interesting. He just had a godly memory. Now watch these words. It goes on. It gets so cool. He says, uh, remember so your genuine faith that is in you, which dwell first in your grandmother Lois and your, and your mother Eunice, and, and I am persuaded is also in you. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gifts. In other words, because of what I just said about what's inside of you and that created godly memory that you have, stir the gifts up. Don't forget about who you came from. Don't forget about those times. Don't forget about what God did. Remember those, if you will, those memories that are godly. You got to create godly memories. Which is so powerful. Number three, things that how to leave your father and mother to develop your own lifestyle is this. Establish a God, God as source. The other day I was... Yeah, let me say it like this to you. Guy comes to me and he wants to draw on one of my jobs. And the guy that I'm building the house with his dear friend and he's in this church. And he didn't say anything. But he knew I was getting cheated. Uh, San Bernardino language screwed. Are we on the same page? <laughs> and so the guy asked for something and when actually the guy cost me something. And I looked at him and I said, okay. And I took out the checkbook. Wrote him a check. And afterwards he said these words to me. He says, how do you do that? Why do you do that? That guy was wrong in what he did, and yet you paid him anyway. And you paid him with a smile? I said, there's the most important thing on any business you run. It's not about money. It's not about who's right, who's wrong. It's about whether God is present on your job. If God is present, where his presence is, is his blessings. This is not about money. It's about God. And we always boil everything down to money. Our macho, who's macho? You know, us men like to, whoever's the most macho. Forget that stuff. This is all about the source. The source is not money. Now, that doesn't mean I'm stupid, just throw it away. The source is, I will keep God present. Because God is the source of my success, not the money that's in my pocket. And if I keep God, so he didn't understand that just looked at me baffled and said, why do you do that? How do you do that? You should have said something. I would have said something. A good businessman would have said something. I said, a good businessman would have said something. But a godly businessman, his source is God. And there's a big difference between a good businessman and a godly businessman. I am a lousy businessman because I'm a good businessman. But I'm working to be a godly.
businessmen. And there's completely difference in the outcome of life when God remains and you work at him being your source. Not the numbers on a page, not the people that pat you on the back, not whether you just won the macho contest or not the macho contest, or whether you caught somebody from messing you over. It's whether or not you keep God in front of you. And so establish in your families that God is always your source. I love what it says in Isaiah 40, verse 31. We'll close with this tonight. In Isaiah 40, but those who wait, the word wait there means to be entangled. Uh, it's an interesting word. See the word wait? I wish I'd highlighted the word wait. Could you guys in the back highlight that word wait? I don't know if you can do that or not. But if that word wait was understood properly, it's like a three cord rope. You know, you have one cord is, has a certain strength. Then you add another cord to it and wind it. It's a double strength. Then a third cord is like pff, almost unbreakable. And when you wind yourself around God, is what he's just said. More than just sit back and do nothing. That's not what he's talking about. But when you wind yourself around God. See, in my business, I wind myself the best I can. I'm not perfect at this. Please, hear me. I mean, uh, you may hear about me making a mistake. You know, wind yourself around God. Shall renew their strength. Now, all of a sudden, there's a source now. Not... The money, not the time, not the effort, not whether you won the business, didn't win the business, whether you got the numbers on the page, didn't get the numbers. That's never, it's never the answer. The answer to your future is what's your source. And will renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings of eagles. That means you're soaring above the problems. And they shall run and not be weary. Why? Because God is on your side. Who, who runs and is not weary? Who is it that runs and runs and runs and doesn't become weary? Only somebody who wings are out there like God that takes them to where they need to go. You need God on your side. More than you need the money. More than you need the power. More than you need the recognition. More than the numbers on the page. More than what an accountant can say. You need to establish the real source of your life that got to come from God. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We faint all the time because our sources are run out. Because our source is the wrong source. And guys, when it says these simple words, leave your father and your mother, what it's really saying is establish a husband and wife together. A plan for life this is all about God. It's all about godly memories. And it's all about his being the source. And if you do that, <laughs> you've done your job. And you're going to have a great marriage. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. You that? Good, you know that. <laughs> I'm going to let you go before I go. Does anybody need to get right with God? Let's talk about it just for a moment. You don't get to go to heaven because you're nice or pretty. You don't go to heaven because you came to church tonight. You don't get to go to heaven because you think you're a Christian. You don't go to heaven because you say you're a Christian. In order for you to go to heaven and for me to go to heaven, there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's Jesus' way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't make it your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to make it Jesus' way. That's how you get to heaven. And tonight, I just want to make sure every single one of you that are in here do it Jesus' way. I already know you know who Jesus is or you wouldn't be here. We sang songs about him, read the scripture about him, all that. Let me say this to you, you but knowing who Jesus is doesn't get you to go to heaven. Nope. Doesn't get you to the devil knows who Jesus is. Stop, think about it for a moment. He knows who Jesus is, so he's not going to heaven. 
So you just knowing who Jesus is doesn't get you to heaven. Going to church or being a nice person, sitting in a church or being a social person that gets along with society doesn't make you a Christian good enough to get to heaven because you can't get to heaven because you're good. There's only one way to heaven. Like I said, you must be born again. Jesus said, John 3rd chapter. To be born again means you've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. Listen to me. You've got to give him all of your heart. You've got to give him all of your life. You know why you've got to give it to him? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do this. It's got to be your call, your choice. No one can make you do this. It won't work. It's got to come from your heart where you give God, it's your heart, you give God your heart, you give God your life. Here we are in a safe, friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung songs, we've enjoyed tonight together. We've prayed for our friends. We just want you to know, tonight is your night of salvation. And you need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. You say, well, pastor, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you, he said. So in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And as you put your hand up, guess what? I'll see it. What did he say? If you confess me before where? A man. I'm a man, I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. What you're saying by the raising of your hand when I count to three is you want to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life, and you don't want to go to hell, but you do want to go to heaven. I'll see your hand go up, put it right back down. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, I'll be embarrassed if I do that. I'll feel funny. Uh huh, you might. But it's better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever. So tonight is your night of salvation. Tonight is your night. I don't care how old you are, I don't care how young you are. You haven't given them all of your heart, given them all of your life tonight is your divine appointment with God to give God all of your heart and all of your life. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. You get your hand up, let me see it, put it right back down. How simple is that? Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. There's three. Thank you. God bless you. There's there's. There's four, thank you, God bless you. There's five back here, God bless you. There's six, God bless you, thank you. Anybody else? Remember, you can't do this for somebody else, you gotta do it themselves. There's seven, there's eight, thank you. God bless you, anybody else? There's nine, thank you. I already, I already got them, Danny, thank you. There's eight, anybody else? Real quick, there's eight wise people. Where are you, nine, 10? Anybody else, real quick? You need to get your hand up, but you didn't already, but you need to, you know you should. You know you should. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for eight wise people. Here's what I'm going to have you do real quick. All eight of you that raise your hands, and anybody that should have raised their hand, hello, I'm talking to you that you know you should have. Get a hold of your coat, purse, water, Bible, friends, stuff. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle. Bring a friend if you need to. If you're sitting next to somebody, say, come on, I'll go with you. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Let's stand and welcome them. No one leave during this period of time. But if you need to come, you come right now. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God, get up here right now. Come, 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 come. I surrender Come on, come on. guys have come real quick. It only takes a moment. See this guy waving at you? Pastor Joel, really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. Is that okay? I promise you. He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Number one. Number two, he's going to give you some free book information, easy reading about what to do next. And number three, he's going to tell you about a program we have that will help you get strong in Jesus so you don't go back and fall through the cracks. Only takes a few moments. People you came with, they'll wait for you. Is that okay? So make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.
hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.